Royal Sushi and Izakaya is a passion project. On their one roof, you have a boisterous izakaya for some great food. Tucked away behind the Noran curtains of the izakaya, I have my omakase service. Omakase literally means, I'll leave it up to you. So it's a chef experience where you get to see the chef's vision. And there I do my 17 course, $300 omakase for 16 people a night, eight people a seating. Every chef's dream is to have both things, right? You want a fun, loud, volume packed place. In the same space, I have my very serious chef tasting meal where I get to make the food I want. You know, I get to control everything. And that's, I think, a chef's dream to have both. Hey, I'm Jesse Ito, I'm the chef owner here at Royal Izakaya. 10 hours before omakase service, fish is coming in right now from Japan. Let's bring it on in. This is Nobu, he's the owner of Yama Seafood. He distributes to some of the best Japanese restaurants in the area. This was caught on Sunday in Japan, packed on uh, Monday yeah. in Toyosu, brought on the airport, and then uh, it arrived last night at JFK. A few hours later, brought it over to you. Today's Tuesday, yeah. Huh. This bill's pretty big. It's so long that it's on a two-pager. It's pretty big. Not your biggest, but. Yeah, but that, that's just for today. There's yeah. three more deliveries. Tuna, bluefin. Yeah. Oh my God, it's heavy. It's nine o'clock. Fish just got dropped. I can't stay on the ice too long, otherwise it damages the fish. I have to get it out. Cleaned, gutted, scaled, prepared. Some's gonna go in the dry age, or some's gonna go in the walk-in. A lot of it will be used for tonight's service. Here are some farm mackerel. Mackerel is my favorite fish. It, it's oily, it's fatty. I also gravitate towards fish that I think are a challenge for the like American palate. Growing up in my dad's restaurant, mackerel was a fish that a lot of customers immediately said no to. They probably had a bad experience. It's a very technical fish because of the oil content. It has to be extremely fresh. That fish gets salt cured, gets vinegar soaked. I like a good challenge. I like to let diners know that Things they may not have thought they like, they actually love. This is the Kue, Japanese long tooth grouper. This one's gonna get aged for at least a week. You can kind of see it's already in rigor. You gotta handle with care because this could easily just mess up your whole day. So what they've done here, this little chop, and there, you see there's a little hole here. This is the Ikejime process. That's a Japanese technique. They stick a metal rod down the spine to kill the nerves. Keeps the fish from decomposing so quickly. You can tell an immediate difference when you work with a fish that's ikejime and one that's not. The flesh kind of tears a bit for the ones that are, have not been processed that way. Whereas this one, if I were to cut into it today, it's like, it's just so pristine, so tight. Got a ton of fish I gotta break down right now. I usually have a couple more hands, but since we have so much fish, I came in a little early to get started. But between three sushi chefs, we usually spend about four hours getting all this fish broken down, sorted out, plus a couple more hours of skinning, slicing, getting ready for service. I always start my fish prep with the fish that have to get salted or cured first, because that takes time. So we're gonna start with the Spanish mackerel. All right, so first part cleaning process, we always cut the fins off. You just wanna get as much as the guts out as possible. That's what really rots it very quickly. Salt curing, what it does is essentially pull out a lot of the excess moisture. Mackerels, it's important because we're gonna vinegar soak later, so it allows the vinegar to penetrate easier and better. So that's gonna salt cure for about 20 minutes. So let me get the squid out. This is the Aori Ika, big fin reef squid. I love using this squid specifically from Japan. This one is super meaty, sweet, delicious. You cannot get this from America, this squid. Yeah, this is a $72 squid <laughs> to understand this cost. Woo! There we go. Ink sack intact. You do not want to pop that. <laughs> this is the spine. This is the only kind of like bone in the squid. I guess it's not a bone, it's like cartilage. The squid has millions of layers of skin on it. But you just take a towel or a paper towel, and if you just go like this, you see this film like that? You want to get this layer off. Rubbing squid skin off. Sticking my hand in fish stomachs to take all the guts out. Like, that's my zen time. 
So Ishigaki Dai, Spotted Knife Jaw Bream, also known as Barred Knife Jaw Bream because of these crazy spines it has. This is one of my favorite fish to work with. I'm using it for the omakase this season. This one's gonna get aged, so it has to get cleaned very well. This process, Tsukibiki, is the knife scaling. Just removes the scales off of the skin. Fish like this one, this Ishigaki Dai, you have to do it this way because the scales are so compact that if you use another scaling tool, they just won't come off and they'll end up all over your cutting board. You have to do the entire thing by hand. So this is gonna take a bit of time. Growing up in my dad's restaurant, my dad's from uh, Kyushu, Japan. He's a classically trained Japanese chef. My mom's from Seoul, Korea. They opened a restaurant in 1979, one of the first Japanese restaurants in South Jersey called Fuji. I started working there when I was 14, so I learned everything, like the foundation of what I know there. These fish heads, we actually save them and the collars and we're gonna use them in the izakaya. They're gonna be fried. It's a dish called kabutoage, served with the ponzu sauce. Getting the best meat available for a great price. So we cross-utilize a lot of things, so there's zero waste. It's 10 o'clock. I'm gonna break down the tuna upstairs. I did what I had to do down here. This is like 120 pounds. It's from a 500 something pound fish from Spain. All right, here we are. This is the sushi bar. This is where the omakase happens. I do two seatings a night, 17 courses. Gotcha. One, two, three. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> that is a big tuna. This is the belly cut. All of this right here, this is otoro. This is the super fatty tuna belly. And all of here, this is gonna be chutoro. And this is the akami, the lean part. This is the kama. So this does have kamatoro here. This is good if you grill it or torch it. It has a lot of muscle tendon. So very chewy, but delicious if you cook it. When I do this, I'm measuring for a saku cut. So this is like the length of the filet you want to work with for sushi. When it gets cut into that like long rectangular shape, this is the size. So I'm going to just cut it down in usable chunks. Parts of it that are more chewy, the tail end or end bits, that'll be put off to one of my sous chefs. Some of it's gonna get dry aged, some of it's gonna get used today, and some of it's not gonna get dry aged. It's just gonna be stored and probably used tomorrow. This loin right here is $2,500. Yeah, this is $2,500 of fish. Tuna is a quintessential sushi fish because of just the flavor. I mean, when you eat bluefin tuna like this, there is nothing that tastes like this. The umami, the depth of flavor, the fattiness, the richness. This paired with nice acidic rice, soy sauce, it's like the perfect bite. This is a special paper called Miguro paper. Each roll costs $10. I mean, it, it's a highly absorbent, thick paper that just maintains the quality of fish, especially for tuna, but we use it for everything. So 120 pound of that bluefin, we're gonna go through that in five days. Truly wild. Go birds. So this here is Edwin. He's one of our sushi apprentices here. He's gonna be wrapping all the tuna to put away in the walk-in. That's it for the breakdown as of right now. It'll continue through the day, but I'm gonna get the rice started since that takes some time. Okay, it's 11 o'clock. Let's start washing. We do three batches of this a day, but my omakase rice, I use a special grain, special vinegar. This is called the hitomibore. It means love at first sight. This is my akazu rice vinegar. It has to stay closed and contained to keep the acidity of the vinegar. You can't keep it open. This is the rice washing process. Sushi rice is a little sticky. It's mainly because of just this natural starch on the rice. You see the starch coming off right now. You don't want it to be too sticky where it's like unmoldable. You also don't want it to be too soft, too hard. So it's so technical to get this part right. I always equate nigiri to clay work, which is what I love doing in pottery. You're just molding the rice and the better the rice, like the better clay, the better your product. But this is the most technical part of the day, actually. Rice is way more important than the fish. Obviously you need great fish, great product to make great sushi. But if you don't have good rice, it doesn't matter how good the fish is. So rice is straining for eight minutes. Hey, timer just went off. Got to cook the rice. This is the rice net. We use the net so we can easily pull it out. Otherwise the rice kind of sticks to the pot. Do 36 minutes in this gas cooker. Always double check that the flame's on. I, in the beginning I have um, hit that switch and the flame did not go on. And then 36 minutes later, you're left with some really wet raw rice and a really, really messed up day. <laughs> 
While the rice is cooking, let's go over here. This is another sushi apprentice, Elmer. He's been with us for over a year, started as a dishwasher, super skilled. He is taking all that toro, that muscle part that's super chewy, scraping all out, and then he's gonna go in it again to take out even more connective tissue. So it's like a super labor intensive process. This takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, but if a restaurant like can do this, that's how you utilize a whole tuna. Rice is cooking. While that's cooking, this is the dry ager. Dry ager, built for beef, but I mean, I think, and fish. Okay. Dry aging, what it does is it concentrates the flavor. This, oh, this is the Kuwait. You saw one of these earlier, so you can kind of see how it's completely dried out, leathered out. This is the Ichigaki Dai. The way we cut it, we retain the filet we're gonna use later. So looks like um, I'm like the fish Hannibal Lecter in a way, right? This is the oh, aged bluefin tuna. Beautiful piece, so we're gonna use this tonight. I'm gonna cut into it. We got 15 minutes till the rice is done and I'm gonna have to do the sharizu, so let's break this down. This is not every day that I use aged tuna. I just started incorporating it. It's very different than beef. There's no fungus or mold that you're trying to build up. That doesn't form on here and you don't want it. I mean, this is gonna be eaten raw. Coming through, rice, if you're here. Rice is cooked, this is the sharizu. This is the process of incorporating my rice vinegar mixture into the rice. It has to happen right now when it's steaming. This process is important, one, for germification. It, the acidity prevents it from building up mold or building up any bacteria. The other process is it encapsulates every grain of rice and it protects the flavor and it makes it super malleable, so. This thing, the hangiri is made of Japanese cypress wood, super resistant to rot, warping, mold, and it doesn't have so much of a fragrance, so it's great to do rice in it. This thing itself, the size, is like five, six hundred dollars, so these things you try to keep for years. What a lot of people don't know about sushi is sushi actually means sour rice, so originally, before nigiri sushi became a thing where it's pressed molded, but I do it at omakase, sushi was a fermented fish. They took fish, they took rice, salt, vinegar, and they essentially barreled it up for years. And the lacto-fermentation from the rice would ferment the fish and then they would grill it later. So we're gonna let this sit for about 10 minutes, air out, flip it, then put it in the warmer. All right, one o'clock. Still a lot to do, but caviar should be here any minute. I'm Gary, hey. yeah. What's going on? Got the goods? Oh, I brought you some of the... <laughs> Delicious caviar. We got the premium Masatra from Italy. Very nice texture. We're gonna use these in the next five days between omakase and izakaya. So on a, any given piece, you're probably gonna get like that much caviar. I don't believe in like, I hate it when you get like two grains and I'm like, what is that, so. Amazing. It's perfect, thanks. Like always. It's 1.30. It's time to get slicing on some of this fish, get ready for service. So first I'm gonna start with the king salmon belly from New Zealand. This is a Yanagi Japanese fish slicer, single bevel. It's a special Damascus metal. You can kind of see that design. It's made from Ninohi. This one takes like a year or two to get. I like it because it's just very agile. I do a lot of unique slicing based on the fish, based on the way it eats, the texture, if it's gonna get torched or not, presentation. You'll see some pieces get double cut. That's either for looks or it's also in case there might be a pin bone that broke off. And so if you do a double slice, you'll catch that. Also just looks so pretty. I'll say omakase sushi is just raw fish. That's why you gotta make it look pretty. It's only eight seats. It's only 16 seats a night. It's only one of me. It's 2.45, we're in the izakaya. I'm here with Chef Justin. He runs the izakaya menu, I run the omakase. Justin and I have been working together for a few years now. He's super talented, we you know, depend on each other for each other's opinions on the food. It's nice to kind of have that backing or that person to bounce ideas off of. So uh, we're doing yaki gyutan, which is grilled beef tongue. We 
braised the beef tongue, and then it is marinated in mirin, soy, and sake. And then there's two sauces. There's a salsa matcha, and then there's a shio negi, which is like the traditional Japanese garnish for this dish. Charred scallion, raw garlic, sesame, some lime to tie the two sauces together. That sounds really amazing. So while I'm a sushi chef, restaurateur type of person, I also love photography, and I do all the social media photography for the restaurant. So let's head on upstairs to get this shot. So we're in my office right now, staying right on top of the izakaya. This is where I do all my photography to get all the specials done to get the menu photographed. I got my uh, light box here, um, big diffuser. This is my Canon R6 Mark II. Uh, I just upgraded finally. I go for up close and personal. Normally, if we have an izakaya special, I'll set aside about 10, 15 minutes to get it photographed. I do have to upload this on my computer get it edited, I'll send it over to my GM, Nicole, and she'll get it up on Instagram. It's 325, uh, we still got a lot more to do. What I'm working on right now is the omakase menu. It's dated, so I do it every day, and obviously there might be some changes. I have to do it right now to get it to the team so they can print it, get it folded, stamped, and ready to go. So let's get going. Four o'clock. Let's uh, pop into the kitchen. This is my father, Masaharu Ito. He's from Japan. He taught me everything I know. Sushi master making the tamagoyaki for tonight. This is a very technical thing. He's way better than me. Mm, not exactly. I think he's doing very well. I think a couple more years to come, his prime time will come. He has to think about what he's gonna do the rest of life. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm very happy right now. Yeah. Working with my dad in this context is much easier, you know, back in the day when he was teaching me, I was a resentful, young, cocky kid. <laughs> now it's great. He gets to go home early. I handle all the problems and uh, it feels good. This tamagoyaki is essentially like a sweet, savory egg omelet. It's the most technical egg omelet you can make just because of the motion required to do it. You can see he's kind of doing this flipping motion in a square copper tamagoyaki pan. So it's very technical, very hard to get that motion down. Okay, it's 4.30. I'm going upstairs to take a 20 minute break. This is the only time I get, so let's go. I'm gonna eat my lunch. Okay, five o'clock. Got my break, ready to do final prep. We got an hour to go, 30 minutes till pre-shift, so. I just have a couple things I still have to cut. I got the squid, I got the live scallop, both on heavy, the shrimp. Been doing this for a long time, but there is a lot of pressure to execute. It's 5.30, time for pre-shift. I'm here with Samantha, she's my omakase server, my wingman, she's been here for seven years working with me. What do we got tonight? So, two allergies tonight. One guest at six o'clock has a mackerel allergy and another guest at six o'clock cannot eat shrimp. That is all. Today we are booking Tuesday, February 20th and Wednesday, February 21st. It's pretty far out. It's the first date we have available. Great. For tonight, the shimaji, the kue, the ichigaki dai, noduguro, and the akami and toro are all dry-aged. For add-ons, I have the A5 Wagyu, caviar toro, Hokkaido uni, so I have a very special one in case people want to get it. We have the spicy crunchy tuna tamaki, toro uni, caviar tamaki, and my dad's tamago. It's 5.40, we got 20 minutes till service starts. Samantha, we can start seating uh, 10 up, so in 10 minutes. Otherwise, you know, we're about to do what we do every day. The show begins soon. Omakase is a performance in the sense that everything leading up to it is very physical, technical, fast-paced, precise work, and the clock is just ticking, ticking, ticking. And everything leads up to this one moment where the show begins the guests are seated and we get going. At that point, everything's pretty much prepared. It's just assembling the nigiri. But the assembly part is, to me, it's like a dance. Kumamoto oyster with toro tartar to start. You can use your hands, make sure you do one bite. Okay. It's all best seen in 30 seconds. 
The omakase is also a performance in the sense that I am directly engaging with all my customers. I am live for them, and if there's any type of emotion in the day or any type of thing that's on my mind, I have to clear that and I have to be ready. This is the Katsuo Tataki, charred Japanese bonito. These people have waited months to get in to experience this with me, and they're paying a lot of money, and it, it's important to make sure that energy-wise and personality-wise, I'm there too to be with them. I want it to be a great experience, and part of what makes omakase great is you are right there with the chef, who you're watching them make every piece. They can explain to you what's going on. You guys see the process, and they can explain to you the best way to eat it in their mind, and that's a very special connection.